Greetings, I'm Dr. Nick Mather, and welcome to the second of my videos on religion in America. As Puritans began the work of altering the landscape of the North American continent and setting roots in what had previously been uncultivated land, they soon experienced a transformation of spirit that shaped the trajectory of American religion and values for all future generations of Americans. The First Great Awakening, a religious revival that swept through colonial America beginning in the early 1700s, was primarily a response to the decline of Puritanism. It emphasized personal experiences of conversion and the piety of the individual, setting the ground for the American Revolution. At the center of the First Great Awakening was the Puritan preacher Jonathan Edwards. Historian of American religion George Marston describes Edwards as a towering figure among the founding fathers of the first American Revolution, the spiritual revolution of the Awakening. The First Great Awakening had its roots in an international pietist movement, which emphasized the religion of the heart that demonstrated one's individual commitment to their faith. The focus on individual piety was part of a broader movement in Europe that prioritized individualism and the self as the arbiter of authenticity. However, there was a difference between the secular and religious emphasis on the self. In the secular realm, the focus on the self led to independence and self-sufficiency. Whereas for the pietist, their individual experiences demonstrated their faith and dependence upon God. Although the Puritans were pietist, by the early 18th century, the colonies had become much more than a Puritan enclave. Immigrants brought with them a variety of religious faiths, or none at all. As in English villages, taverns became social centers. The Puritans had been tolerant of alcohol, although not drunkenness. A youth culture developed in New England that was also part of the tavern culture. Young people were postponing marriage until their mid to late 20s because there was a shortage of land within communities. Colonists typically lived on garden-sized plots of land that were distributed among family members, but people were having large families, so you know, up to nine children. So while the population was increasing, available land within communities was running short. Unless grown children abandoned their families and struck out on their own elsewhere, there was no land for hopeful young couples to create their own homesteads, independent of their parents. The result was a culture of youth who were showing increasing disrespect to their elders and transgressing traditional morals. For example, not only was public drunkenness increasing, but so was premarital pregnancy. Not something we usually associate with the Puritans. Theological challenges to Puritanism were also emerging. As I explained in the previous video, Puritanism originally emerged from Calvinism, a Protestant denomination begun by the Swiss reformer John Calvin. Calvin's theology taught that because of original sin, humans were totally depraved and only a select few, the elect, would be saved. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was only meant for the chosen elect. Consistent with Luther's teachings, Calvin taught that good works did not lead to salvation. Rather, salvation was only possible by the grace of God. God's grace was irresistible, and once saved, salvation was permanent. Furthermore, God had predetermined who would be members of the elect and those who would be forever damned. God's sovereignty denied human freedom. 
many of these points were being challenged by a growing humanism that viewed humans as essentially good rather than inherently sinful. Theologically, the greatest objection to Calvinism was Arminianism, which denied predestination and affirmed human free will. In his Freedom of the Will, Jonathan Edwards affirms predestination, but he makes it clear at the beginning that he is not doing so simply because it is a tenet of Calvinism. Instead, he argues that freedom of the will is contrary to virtue and vice. According to Edwards, freedom of the will implies an indifference of the will. And if the will is indifferent, so must be the heart. But the nature of virtue is that once virtue has become habitual, it becomes part of one's character. As Edward writes, The stronger and the more fixed and determined the good disposition of the heart, the greater the sincerity of virtue, and so the more of the truth and reality of it. To have a virtuous heart is to have a heart that favors virtue and is friendly to it, and not one perfectly cold and indifferent about it. The will simply cannot choose between virtue and vice because that would deny the habits of the heart. In this sense, then, the will is not free. And yet it was an earthquake in New England on October 29, 1727, that would create a earthquake of spirituality in the colonies. The earthquake had caused moderate destruction to buildings and gave Edwards and other New England pastors fuel for the message that God was not pleased with the immorality running rampant in the colonies and that the earthquake was a warning of future judgments. The aftershocks of the earthquake were jolts of awakenings, whereby people began to repent and rededicate themselves to their faith. However, the incident that would lead to a full-scale awakening, which would cause tremors throughout all of the colonies, was the sudden death of a popular and admired young man in Northampton where Edwards preached. Edwards used the young man's untimely passing to spread the message that death could strike anyone at any instant. Parishioners had better be prepared for what awaits them in eternity then. His message was readily accepted throughout Northampton. His parishioners began to congregate for Bible study and prayer in private homes rather than in the public tavern. Newly awakened youth gathered in lines at Edwards' study door seeking spiritual counsel. Edwards was so impressed with the mass awakenings that he wrote an account of what was happening, a faithful narrative of the surprising work of God, which he could share with other pastors in the colonies. By his own description, there was scarcely a single person in the town, either old or young, that was left unconcerned about the great things of the eternal world. Those that were wont to be the vainest and the loosest, and those that had been most disposed to think and speak slightly of vital and experimental religion, were now generally subject to great awakenings. And the work of conversion was carried on in a most astonishing manner and increased more and more. Souls did, as it were, come by flocks to Jesus Christ. From day to day, for many months together, might be seen evident instances of sinners brought out of darkness into marvelous light and delivered out of a horrible pit and from the miry clay and set upon a rock with a new song of praise to God in their mouths. Edwards' narrative set off a revivalist fire in the colonies, which burned so bright that it caught the attention of pietists in England, Scotland, and even Germany. When published in Britain, the narrative inspired the brothers John and Charles Wesley, the founders of Methodism, and their young friend George Whitefield. Whitefield eschewed the traditional pulpit in favor of preaching outdoors, where he drew immense crowds, often numbering in the tens and thousands. In 1738, he followed his friend John Wesley to Georgia, 
which would be the first among several trips Whitefield would make to the colonies. He returned home later in 1738 and returned to Philadelphia the following year. Edwards met Whitefield in 1740 when Whitefield was preaching to massive crowds in Boston. According to George Marston, Whitefield's farewell sermon drew an estimated crowd of somewhere between 23,000 and 30,000 persons. Whitefield appealed to the people by insisting upon their authority. He told the crowds that their spiritual suffering might be due to spiritually dead pastors. Whitefield told the awakened that they should challenge pastors who were lacking in spirituality. By doing so, Whitefield ushered in the core principle of democracy, the authority of the common people, via religion before it emerged in the politics of the revolution. Now, most Americans are familiar with Jonathan Edwards, if they are familiar with him at all, through his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This was originally delivered to a packed two-room house in Enfield, Connecticut in 1741, after his meeting with Whitefield. In the sermon, Edwards likens a depraved soul to a spider dangling by the flimsiest filament over the fiery pits of hell. It is only the grace of a merciful, loving God who prevents the spider from falling into eternal damnation. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you and is dreadfully provided. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times so abominable in his eyes as the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet tis nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. Tis to be ascribed to nothing else that you did, not to go to hell the last night that you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep. And there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning, but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you haven't gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God, provoking his pure eyes by your sinful, wicked manner of attending his solemn worship. Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason. Why don't this very moment drop down into hell? Edwards reportedly was unable to complete the sermon during his first attempt at delivering it due to the cacophony created by a screaming and moaning audience crying out in spiritual anguish. This was unfortunate because it prevented Edwards from getting to the part of the sermon that taught about God's mercy. And now you have an extraordinary opportunity, a day wherein Christ has flung the door of mercy wide open and stands in the door calling and crying out with a loud voice to poor sinners, a day wherein many are flocking to him and pressing into the kingdom of God. Many are daily coming from the east, west, north, and south. Many that were very lately in the same miserable condition that you are in, are in now in happy state, with their hearts filled with love to him that has loved them and washed them from their sins in his own blood, and rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. The message of Edwards, Whitefield, and other revivalists was clear. People are lost trapped in sin, without any hope of saving themselves. God's free offer of salvation through grace and faith in Jesus must be accepted because there was no other hope. By appealing to both the intellect and emotions of the unsaved, the end result was an experience of sudden conversion and religious awakening. But Edwards was not all hellfire and damnation. Edwards' best-known sermon is but one in a library of writings. In other sermons, Edwards focused on ideas of joy and pleasure, beauty and harmony, and love and delight. For Edwards, 
a loving God was at the center of creation. God constantly poured forth his love to his creation so that our highest good is to return that love to God. If we love God, then we should also love what God loves, including God's good creation. This idea is what informs Edward's definition of true virtue. He wrote that true virtue consists in benevolence to being in general. It is that consent, propensity, and union of heart to being in general that is immediately exercised in a general goodwill. According to Edwards, to live virtuously is to love God's creation. We should love others and the natural world regardless of personal benefit or self-interest. Furthermore, in Beauty of the World, dated in 1725, Edwards suggests that the beauty of the natural world mirrored the beauty of virtue. The fields and woods seem to rejoice, and how joyful do the birds seem to be in it. How much a resemblance is there of every grace in the fields covered with plants and flowers, when the sun shines serenely and undisturbedly upon them. How a resemblance, I say, of every grace and beautiful disposition of mind, of an inferior towards a superior cause, preserver, benevolent benefactor, and a fountain of happiness. How great a resemblance of a holy and virtuous soul in a calm, serene day. It has been argued that this surge of renewed faith prompted by the Great Awakening and the Second Great Awakening that would occur after the Revolution was the decisive factor in the emergence of an American national consciousness. The Great Awakening was believed to be the process by which God established his kingdom in the New World. The Great Awakening has been contributed with the rise of democratic and republican ideas that would eventually coalesce in the formation of the American government. I will examine the Second Great Awakening in the next video.